heard it from a founder of the public city. Fascinated by the rapid urbanization of our cities and its impact on the human experience, Meredith has spent her career working to enhance cultural and economic vibrancy through integrating art and creativity in the urban environment. Driven by her passion for people, places, and community fabric connecting them, Meredith's work focused on human centered solution-based strategy, programs, and experiences that enhance quality of space and the human connection to it. Before co-founding Public City, Meredith led Art Alliance Action for nearly a decade, launching award-winning programs and initiatives, including large-scale multi-site culture events, encouraging public art and design projects, consulting on culture-led economic and community development strategies. As an artistic director, Meredith has collaborated with and commissioned acclaimed Austin-based and international curators, artists, and designers, earning numerous awards and recognition for artistic excellence. Her work has been featured on the cover of Urban Man magazine, Austin American Statesman, and in the Austin Chronicle in and she has received impact awards from the city of Austin and the Downtown Austin Alliance. Starting her career at Visit Austin, she's rooted in a deep understanding of the direct relationship between a vibrant creative economy and quality of space. Meredith has, is a graduate of the University of Texas Moody College of Communications and Leadership Austin. She currently serves on the boards of CMU CPS Devolve Austin in the Austin Community Design and Development Center. So, welcome, Mary. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, that was a mouthful. I would have shortened it for you. <laughs> Uh, thank you all. It's such an honor to be here. I don't spend a lot of time on campus, unfortunately. Um, I think the last time I was here was for a Design Futures program a few years ago when Barbara Brown Wilson was still here. So it's an honor to be back. Um, I promise I'm not technical um, and I'm not an academic. So hopefully this will be a little bit light um, and conversational. Um, and we'll kind of take it from there. Might have a little bit of interactivity. So um, be prepared to kind of maybe participate. So, um, in about uh, September, October, National Geographic released some rankings um, about happiest cities. And uh, it was top 25, and Austin actually ranked right at about the, the 25th. And kind of one of those indicators was, you know, obviously happy people, great environment, and, you know, offerings, things like that. But one of the other factors was enlightened leadership. And I started to resonate on that a little bit because we as citizens are actually the ones who empower those leaders through our votes, through our trust. And so I started to think about this in terms of how not only places shape us, which is kind of my work and, and what I've, I've done my career, but also how we have the responsibility and, and possibility to actually shape them, particularly w through our vote and through our community participation. And so when you think about, you know, places shaping us and, and, and that kind of reciprocal relationship, you start to understand, um, I guess, where all of our passions are coming from in terms of our responsibility to do great work. And so we'll talk a little bit about, um, because the, the topic today is places personal, we'll spend a little bit of time on kind of the experiences and places that have shaped me, and then we'll talk about Austin talk about how um, kind of our, our past, which I think you've heard about, at least in the city forum environment, you all have heard about kind of the past and how we've gotten to where we are today. Um, but we'll also talk a little bit about those key things that have gotten us to a place where, you know, it, it's kind of the opposite indicator. On one hand, National Geographic is saying we're one of the happiest cities, but on the other hand, we're one of the most racially and economically segregated. So how do we really uh, how do we reconcile that, particularly in a time when we're looking at things like Code Next, Imagine Austin implementation, and things like that? So real quick before we move on, though, I want you to, as we walk through this talk, I want to put you in the place of something that's really intimate and personal to you. So I want you to kind of take a minute to think about places or experiences that relate to place that have really helped shape you, something that's meaningful to you, something that you love or care about, 
Um, you know, when I was, I was born in Galveston, we'll get into it, but Galveston is somewhere that, you know, I've grown up and I, I love. Um, so think about something that you would really want to protect um, and carry that through this talk, because as we get to things like code next, that's what we have to reflect on is, is that we're all kind of in this together because we're loving something and we want to protect it, but it's also our responsibility to help shape it. So not only does you know, place shape us, but I wanted to give a quick example of how it also shapes other ones we love. So our experience on Congress Avenue every morning, this is a Monday, this is me and my dog, we live downtown. Um, this coffee window opened le less than a year ago and there was never anything in this building. So we would walk by and there was never an experience to be had. Now every morning, Monday through Friday, we stop here, we go down Congress Avenue which is a great walking experience. We stop in, Emily or Rebecca give Charlie a treat, and it's this great positive experience. I get a coffee and I move on. When we do that same walk, but it's closed, Charlie's like not having it at all. He doesn't understand, and it just totally shapes his experience for our walk. And I just wanted to use this as an example that not only does place shape us, but it also kind of trickles down to our daily experiences. It could be something as small as getting a treat every day at the coffee shop. So, as I said, I was born in Galveston, um, and uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't raised in Galveston, we'll get into it, but there's something about being from the Gulf Coast, there's something about being from somewhere where when you walk <coughs> down the street amongst beautiful architecture, it actually celebrates how many times it's been destroyed. You know, you start to think about, when I resonate on this, and actually, Hurricane Ike, um, for our family, was the time we actually finally did lose everything. But when I look at this, um, in retrospect to kind of how Austin is changing now, the resilience that's, that, that comes from this, right? Every, every experience, every storm, every devastation, the community had to come together and piece it back together. And that instills this sense of resiliency in the culture and the community of the people. And so even though kind of this mindset, it helps you kind of understand as someone who loves this place, that more than likely, very soon, it's going to be destroyed and have to be rebuilt again. So that starts to inform, at least it's informed my perspective on how I look at Austin and um, how I deal with its changing environment. We also lived in New Orleans for a little bit of a time. Um, this, just to frame everybody, this is actually Algiers Point. This is um, the Mississippi River the um, French Quarter, Jackson Square, Maroney, Bywater this way, and downtown um, where all the kind of economic activity happens is over here. And for me, New Orleans, sort of this dirty water, um, has always kind of uh, re reflected to me this um, New Orleans. Well, let me just move to this slide. This is Algiers Point, right, where I showed you the Im image. Um, this is all that reflects the history of that place, just this sign right here. And when you read this and take time to actually think about what happened in that place, and it's only reflected in something as small as this, this experience and, and this history of New Orleans shaped me as I lived there from the time I was eight to 11 years old. We, um, but as a young girl, I understood the sacrifices of the people who actually built the city that I was living in and what conditions they were under because of somebody that looked like me. And reconciling with that and growing up into that also shaped my perspective pretty dramatically. And then we moved to Houston and uh, way deep in the suburbs of West Houston. And I wanted to kind of, we went from the suburbs of New Orleans, which was built out of the swamps, um, to essentially a suburb of Houston, which was built out of a uh, flood, floodplain. Um, if I would have pulled this image in August, this image, the majority of everything um, to the east and to the south would have been completely underwater. This is where the Attucks Reservoir um, and the Barker Reservoir are. Um, our neighborhood was one of the first to be developed in this area, even though the developers knew the risk. Um, this neighborhood and area was developed in the 70s and 80s, along with what was happening with the Army Corps of Engineers. They already knew the risk. And the neighborhoods that grew out from the time I was there, which was late 80s to mid 90s, was essentially everything that was completely underwater. 
So again, when I start to think about something that felt so protected, um, and yet in an instant, and now on, will ongoing have the risk of being flooded, that has also helped sort of shape my perspective. But then in downtown Houston, you can see something as hopeful as this, right? So it says we all came in peace, or we came in peace for all mankind, obviously, about space exploration. But when you think about even thinking from the developer standpoint or the planner standpoint, walking into neighborhoods that you know nothing about, what if this was actually the mentality that we took with us? You know, that we're coming in, we're, you know, we're, gonna, we're thinking about your neighborhood, but we're really trying to do it for the better of all. So it's just a really interesting dichotomy of the neighborhood I was from was really built knowing that it was inevitable that it would flood, but yet this is kind of the statement that the city, the ethos of the city, it's really fascinating to think about. So I moved to Austin in 1995. Um, this is from, this was taken from Luna Point not too long ago, but when I moved to Austin, came for college, I came here about five days after I graduated high school, N the buildings that existed this one, this one, and in this picture, that's it. And, you know, when you think about, so when I look at this and I think about this conversation and places personal and places shape us, you know, when I think about how I've, you know, from Galveston to, to New Orleans to Houston now to Austin, what has shaped me, I look at this picture and I see who I am as, you know, as an individual and who I am as a professional. So. If, when you look at this picture and you think, okay, I've been in for, you know, reflecting on who I am, I've been in Austin for almost 25 years. What would you think of, oh, one other building that was, that was here, sorry. This is the C. Holm power plant, right? So, um, what, you know, it has also played it, but it's insignificant where it was one of the only existing. So if you think about that, what components of Austin, and this is going to be interactive, so I want you guys to like play with me a little bit. So if you think about, you all know Austin. Have you been here? Did you all just come for school? How long have you been here? Just give me a few years, zero years? Few? Okay. So you know enough about Austin, right, to know a little bit about it and its culture. So when I look at this and I think about what components have shaped me, what can you give me some thoughts on how the city has shaped me? And you can guess, right? You know I have a dog, right? That's very Austin. I have a dog, right? Rescue dog. Are there other things that you can think about? that you would just say, I would guess that this piece shapes you. Anything? How has Austin, I'll turn it around. How has Austin shaped you in your experience? Have you thought about that? Yes. Okay. you do yeah yeah see yeah the daily life right I came here you know going to the trails that was my entry point I was in high school in Houston I would come here and you know ride mountain bikes and go to Twin Falls and that kind of thing what else how else has has Austin or have you even thought about it how is this city shaping me you thought about it yep star yep yeah so go local loving local loving where we're from again shaping us right like I listen to music at Stubbs or along Red River Cultural District right I mean what else anybody else anybody over here that's interesting I love that you say that because I don't because we do and we are so in it and we love the city but our vo voter turnout is like 10%. So it's really an interesting dichotomy, you know, that we all love our city and we're engaged in it and we talk about it and we think about it. But yet we haven't quite gotten over that and, and so, you know, to dig and unpack that a little bit is is an interesting thing for me. What else? Anything else? No? Yes. It's probably not shaped me. I'm ready. Fully shaped, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, very, uh, very uh, friendly and 
impressed me is the, uh, the dynamics. Dynamics uh, that uh, you can perceive of, um, say, increase in the uh, beauty of the downtown uh -huh. area, uh, dynamics of uh, people, uh -huh. uh, for work or for uh, man work. Right. The, the moment in the dynamics. Uh -huh. The vibrancy, the energy. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I love this city, um, and a lot of it has has really come to I inform my work. And and I'll get down, you know, into it in a little bit. But my eyes have come wide open um, since, in terms of my Austin experience recently. Even though I've been here um, for 25 years, which excites me because it makes me know that the place I can still shape it, and it can still shape me. A lot of times I'll sort of run the trail, again, love outdoors, very, you know, Austin person. Um, but I overlook this point, and this is Luneth Point. It's a point along the trail. And, um, and I sort of have this conversation with the city, and I don't, I don't think everybody does. But, um, and I overlook this, and I say, you know, am I still, are you still relevant to me? Am I still able to impact you, and are you still, like, are we still in love or not? Like, are you doing it for me or not? And if I can't impact you, then, um, uh, then am I in the right place? And, and how, how are we going to continue our relationship together as a city and a citizen? Now we're going to go a little bit into kind of what has transformed and shaped my perspective from a career standpoint. So um, I graduated College of Communications here, Hookham, um, in 1999. And I took about a year and a half off. And um, started my career at six months in a tech agency. And so what I was doing when I was really at this tech firm, because the market had just crashed, was really looking at cool things happening around the country. And one of the things I found was the High Line. And this is a picture of the High Line, um, 2000, 2001. And what the High Line taught me, and the first time that I'd actually seen the power of a community really coming together, again, I was from the suburbs, the idea of urban design and city planning, I think that just wasn't even in my, it just it wasn't even in my sights. Um, but this idea that this community of stewards came together to take on the government and to take on the rail, to have this piece of land donated, was something fascinating to me. And I was watching it unfold, like just a few folks got together and said, we want to take, you know, we want to take this on. And as I watched this unfold, they launched a design competition, they selected the designs. I mean, all of these things were happened because the community came together to make them happen. And now, I mean, now you can fast forward. I had some friends that lived in the Meatpacking District not far, far from here, and they were priced out in five years. I mean, you could see this great intent of the community really wanting to bring a public space to life and, and protect and preserve, and then those, you know, some of those very people then had to leave the neighborhood because of its success. The next thing that happened six months later, I left um, that short tech career and started my um, real career um, at the what's the Visit Austin, it's called the Austin Convention of Visitors Bureau. A week after I started there, which is in the tourism industry, 9-11 happened. And on the one year anniversary of 9-11, Creative Time, which is this amazing organization that does a lot of work in the public realm, um, it's a, a Really, it's a, it's a public art organization. They, con they commission um, a lot of projects in contemporary art. This was the first time I had actually seen the power of art to heal, particularly in the urban context. And so I wanted to kind of, you'll see peppered through the, the rest of the talk how both of these have shaped me as well, so not just from a place standpoint, but how the work plays out and my understanding of it. But no matter where you came from or what your perspective was on 9-11, this was a very powerful image to see rising up a year after. Or actually, I think it was six months after 9-11, in a way to sort of heal and bring a community together to move us through that experience. OK. Are you all familiar with this, the Euclid versus Ambler? OK, so again, not a, did not come through this program. But I wanted to put this up here because now we're getting into how all of this has affected my experience in Austin and where Austin really is as a city um, and why in some instances it's very tenacious. Um, this is pulled from a, a KUT article um, and I just want you to kind of read it um, and then we'll get into the 1928 plan. 
kind of resonate on this for a little bit um, because where we are today is very much because of where we were yesterday. We as a community have not come together to really accept that we have a race problem in this city and it stems from something that happened 90 years ago that we still haven't been brave enough to address. And it's my belief that because place is a very personal and intimate concept that we haven't really spent the time to respect each other's perspectives to actually heal through this. So I just want us to, you all have probably seen this. This is just kind of to, again, the, the idea of this type of zoning was very fresh, was very new, and this was the sort of modern way to approach city. And you look at the communities and areas that were kind of a target, right? Um, and even when I look at this and I think about this is where, where the concentration of the black communities, when I look at Nine, which is along Shoal Creek, which flooded, which would be taken out on a regular basis. When I look at 10, which is along Waller Creek, which is Red River Cultural District now, and all of these really interesting dynamic local places, live music places that we love. But when I look at that and I just think, we really did this. We really destroyed communities as a city um, that was legal. You know, and at the same time as this started to, I had no idea about this until probably about five years ago. And I'm an active citizen. I had no idea that this 1928 plan was our history. And so while that plan shaped many others' experience of place in this city, it really wasn't affecting my experience at all. I mean, I went on to, um, I've lived downtown about 15 years. I went on to chair the Neighborhood Association. You know, while the east side of Austin was dealing with things like investment in schools and basic infrastructure needs and things like that, I'm like crying out my window because I have a tree that's getting cut down because the great streets are gonna be redeveloped and um, the trees are now all gonna be uniform. So th the way that my place was being shaped and my experience was being shaped was so completely different than people and communities just on the other side of a street that was arbitrary, that we decided would happen that way. I mean, I was devastated. I was yelling at this guy, I was crying. I was calling people like, you're cutting down my tree when it was all for, you know, to be improved and really in the end, it was just a tree. You know, my other experience of working downtown was, you know, we were doing things like looking at our alleyways and trying to reclaim them as public space because of super block development. Again, while this is important and this helped shape a master plan for the city, this was my experience. And again, on the other side, people are fighting for their lives. I mean, it was just such a different and dynamic way to experience a place that I thought I knew so much about and that um, after being here for so long, um, thought that I was very familiar with. So 2012, the city passed Imagine Austin. And really, if you read this, it's very, it sounds very exciting. It sounds like the Austin I want to be a part of. Um, you know, we're going to be 200 and um, it, in 2039. Um, I certainly want to be all this. I mean, yes, right? I mean, it's people. We're passionate. I mean, we're diverse. We're creative. We're all these things, right? So again, my experience, and this was also an award-winning plan. I mean, there was, the, for the community engagement that was done around Imagine Austin, it was, you know, almost unheard of how much input had gone into Imagine Austin. So in my mind, I'm going, this is exciting like we are on track we're doing it you know I believe in these things I I mean yeah I'm super excited about our future you know then after that um, came 10-1 and 10-1 I, I used this image for 10-1 because we did a project called drawing lines um, and what it did was it embedded artists in the everyone's familiar with 10-1 is everyone familiar with 10-1 okay so our governmental structure, there was kind of a gentleman's agreement back in the early days of the city to say, okay, we'll have just general representation. So council members will be, an at, it'll be an at-large council, which means our council members will be voted on 
by at large, so by everybody in the community votes on every council member, right? And we'll have a gentleman's agreement that we'll have, you know, we'll have a Latino, we'll have a Mexican, or we'll have a Latino, we'll have an African American, and we'll just, you know, gentleman's agreement, we'll shake on it and make sure so that interests are really considered. And so, you know, after years of resources not being invested in East Austin and Southeast Austin and Northeast Austin and Southwest Austin, um, the community kind of, there was a little bit of an uprising and they had a petition signed that they would restructure the city government and how the city is actually, how all of us as citizens are represented. And so now we have what's called 10-1, which is we have 10 council districts. The city was broken down into 10 council districts. There are about 80,000, so you know, anywhere between 75 and 85, it ends up about 80,000 citizens per district. Um, and now each district elects their own representative, right? And this was meant to diversify the voices of the city council because for many, many years, again, I live in downtown, Central City was getting a lot of the investment and a lot of the attention. And so this was one of our community's sort of efforts from my perspective to start to write that 1928 plan, right? To say, we agree, this isn't quite right. We need to get some better representation. But what's interesting about this um, project is that, and, and particularly for me who had now at this point been here for you know, 18 to 20 years and uh, thought I knew everything, um, we embedded artists into each of the council districts, and they worked for a year in residence, trying to understand what were the dynamics of the districts. Did these, do, do people even understand what that means? Do they even understand that this has transitioned? Do they even understand that they have a role to play in what types of um, programs and incentives and, and, and issues that they can vote on? And what we found is, yes, some are more active than others, but it really represented this entire piece of Austin. I had been to um, two of the locations out of the 10 where we hosted these public art projects. The, pro the projects were kind of co-created with the districts and then they were kind of mounted, um, so a location in the district, they were all put together in an exhibition. But I had been to two out of the 10 locations and I'd been in the city for almost 20 years. And, and that to me started, okay, wait a minute. This is so fascinating that there's so much in this city that I have no idea about. And there are so many types of experiences that people are having that I have no idea about. There are so many issues flooding, you know, that, that I never deal with. And that's shaping my community's issues. So we started to actually make progress, right, on this, on this um, kind of writing this 1928 thing. But the Imagine Austin plan, which is something what, that I was really excited about and I thought everybody in Austin was excited about because so many people had participated, was at risk because now we had 10 new council members. Only one was from the previous council, right? So a whole new slew of leaders, none of which felt like they were, even though the Imagine Austin plan was voted unanimously, it was accepted unanimously, this is going to be the future of the city, but it was accepted by the previous council, right? So now we've got... 10 new people coming in to say, wait a minute, do I, do I love this Imagine Austin plan? Does this represent what I care about? Um, I'll never forget meeting with one of the council members um, and she said, bike lanes are great, but they're serving the people that you all want to move into my neighborhood. They're not serving the people that are in my neighborhood. So I have a real problem with that. You know, it sounds great in theory, but you've missed the mark here. Um, and so, as Imagine Austin, again, I still was sort of just becoming aware of sort of how dynamic our community was and how dynamic this place was and how many experience, different, peop different experiences different people were having. We started an organization called Evolve Austin. And, you know, when we started that organization, it was really all about helping to ensure that the Imagine Austin plan, which we had spent millions of dollars on and 20,000 people gave input on, I mean, you know, we felt like it was buttoned up and it should be the plan was accepted. So we started to evolve to ensure that it would be implemented and to, to bring that perspective to the table because now we're starting to hear rumblings like, wait a minute, Imagine Austin doesn't represent me. Well, we felt like there was a whole other community that it did represent. So we started this organization, Evolve Austin. This was the launch party. It was crazy off the hook. We had all sorts of partners. We had everything from housing advocates to environmental advocates to mobility advocates. I mean, we were just like, this is amazing, right? Like, 
justice coalitions. I mean, people were here and they were excited to implement Imagine Austin. And I kind of, when I think about that, I think, while I do think our experiences were different in many ways of this city, I think in a lot of ways they were still similar. Um, because then you started hearing from folks like Mr. Linder, who runs the NAACP. And Code Next was one of the priority programs out of Imagine Austin, right? And so something has obviously gone awry, right? Like, I'm in love with Imagine Austin. I'm so excited about Evolve. We're putting our time and energy and building this whole like, coalition of all this stuff. Well, Imagine Austin, one of the first priority programs is to align the code, right? So, okay, we're behind code next. Let's do it. Well, every Friday morning, I sit at the NAACP offices with Mr. Linder in a meeting called Building Bridges, and I, this, I respect this man more than anything. And it's been about a year that I've been going to these meetings, and I had no idea what his perspective was on code next. And I had no idea that, wow, there's a, I mean, I, I started to formulate, but I learned something from this man every Friday. And even more so because he's in the news and all this other kind of stuff. And I talked to him about this presentation, so he knows he's a part of it and that he's one of my inspirations. But, you know, I was like, wow, this person that I've sat across the room or in the circle with for a year has such a different feeling about this initiative that I feel really excited about. So what does that mean? Where are we? And there's a whole other community of people behind him that feel the same way that he does. Um, and as I reconcile this, it's because they have, this place has shaped them and generations of their families in a completely different way than it shaped my experience. So when you start to unpack that, you know, and again, this place is personal thing is really just kind of a theory in my mind that I'm working through, but the reality is, wow, how different these different components and different pieces of the city and different locations and different neighborhoods and different investments that we're making at the city level, how differently it shapes citizens' experiences. And you know, on a side note, I was running down Enfield the other day, and this sign was in one of the yards of like this, you know, beautifully well manicured house. And right across the street, I kid you not, right across the street was one of these knocking down the house across the street. And I was like, this is too much. Like, this is just all wow. And so I started to have just an open mind about how different this, this, this one place has shaped multiple types of communities. And so how is it that it comes to this, where there's equally passionate sides um, this is a petition that's been filed to make Code Next go to vote. Um, the council will make that decision um, if they will let it go to vote. But this is 30, a petition with 32,000 signatures. This is no joke. This, for me, is a story of two Austins and how we have been shaped completely differently and how the place has affected us as citizens in completely different ways. And so how is it that when we're really trying to move forward as a city and we think that we're making such great progress, we've got Imagine Austin, we're starting to implement the priority programs in Code Next, how is it now that we've come to this and come to such divisive perspectives? And you know, the mayor spoke the other day at, um, at uh, so CNU is Congress for New Urbanism and we have a luncheon every year and he spoke at it and you know, our goal in starting Evolve was really to bring together a diversity of perspectives so that we could better understand and, and make sure that, that what we were doing was, um, was really rooted in a community that wanted to see it happen. But what he said was there is no one voice that's leading for all. There are still two sides of the argument, and we're still not coming together. And so I saw a TED Talk by um, Liz Ogbe the other day, and you know, her point was this. Communities, particularly communities that are transitioning as fast as we are, um, haven't or are not taking the time to actually heal. The 1928 plan set us on a path that has, in my, in my view, 
if we keep on this path, we will be playing the very short game of being a great city. Um, how can you be a great city if you're not a diverse city? How can you be a great city if you've got such um, economic inequality? How can you really be a great city? And so when I sit across the room from Mr. Linder every Friday, and I listen and I learn from him, and I think, wow, okay, these perspectives are so different, but if we don't come together, how are we really going to be a truly great city? And how can this place shape us all where we feel equally connected and equally just, I guess. I don't have the answers. These are just things I think about. And so it goes back to sort of this idea from LBJ. There are no problems which we cannot solve together, and there are only a very few um, which any of us can settle by himself. So again, when you think about, and when I look at this, you know, this gives me hope. And when I talk to Mr. Linder, he has hope. There are things happening. Um, kind of at the structural level that we're excited about that so even if we do go to petition or the petition goes to vote and even if we never come together there are still some things that are happening um, to invest in this place to make this place a place for all um, but I still think that we don't take enough time in the planning phases or if you're a developer and you're like this is just a great market opportunity or whatever to really look one another in the eyes and to say your story and connection to this place is much different than mine, and I need to better understand where you're coming from so that we can actually design and build and create places that bring you along in that transition and make you feel whole instead of destroying your neighborhood and instead of making you feel like you don't have um, a role to play in this community. And there is hope. I mean, um, we are doing some work, again, kind of back to our work and the role that kind of art is playing. Um, we're working with the Downtown Austin Alliance, which is kind of a big group of property owners. It's, I think, what you would probably kind of expect and think, but they really set out in a year-long process to think about and spend time listening to what the community's vision of a downtown would be. And when they asked us to do the engagement work, um, one of the things that I wanted to be sure of is that, you know, I'm being asked to go into communities that you, you haven't, the city hasn't, the leadership hasn't talked to in a very long time. And if you have talked to them, you haven't followed up with investing resources in them to really try to make them whole. And so I need a commitment from you all that if we go do this engagement work and we really hear what the community wants, that you've got some accountability and some ownership to really listen and really make sure that you're bringing those ideas to the table when you think about how you're going to shape the vision of the future of a downtown particularly a downtown Austin for all, because right now, and I see it every day, right now the, the, the downtown is on a trajectory, and they know this too, um, that that is not necessarily a place where everyone feels welcome, right? So we were able to get down to 51 different zip codes, people from 51 different zip codes participated. We had people ages four to 84 of all different abilities, of all different perspectives, come to the table and participate and really tell us what they want the future of downtown to be. Um, and so I have hope that it ended up being a 50-foot long community table. It lives in Republic Square Park, which is kind of where the city was uh, under the Auction Oaks, was laid out. And um, so there are things like that that I have, that I have hope for. Um, we're doing some work on East 12th Street. And, um, you know, I, there's so much happening over there. Developers bought up about 120 parcels along East 12th Street. Um, there's not, no transparency yet on what's going to happen with that. It's about 75 acres. Um, and so, you know, the results of that are remain to be seen. But we're having conversations that I hope will help it move in the right direction. And when I talk about healing, I just wanted to kind of, I'm going to wrap up in probably two minutes. So um, I... When I was in New Orleans, I took that first picture. This is Algiers Point. And, I, and, and what, I, what, I, what I'm kind of, when I think about healing and what does it actually take to acknowledge that um, we've done wrong and um, work to repair that, because how do you move forward and move together as a community if you don't even accept that you need to heal? And um, I think about this experience that I had. Um, bring you back to Algiers Point, okay? This is where the um, slaves were held 
uh, before they went to auction across the river. And this, art, this artist right here, her name is Kara Walker. And she is one of the kind of predominant um, African-American contemporary artists of our time right now. And a lot of her work deals with slavery and kind of the, the African-American story in the United States. And she was recently commissioned by an organization called Prospect New Orleans to do a project in New Orleans. And she created this incredible instrument, which is this. Um, and the imagery is um, kind of imagery. She has a lot of really powerful images from kind of the um, from kind of plantations and things like that. And it was etched. It was really beautifully done. It's a 36 pipe calliope. And a calliope is like an organ, like a pipe organ, but it's a steam organ. And it's in response to the riverboat Natchez that goes up and down the river, that you know toots out of its calliope. These very positive Dixieland sounds, right? Do do do, you know, like everything's been great in the Dixieland. And this instrument would respond to that positive sort of sound with a perfectly composed piece, or even a song that was kind of a historic song that was saying um, that sounded like chants that was so powerful, um, and sometimes screams, and sometimes you know, like, we'll, we're going to rise and we're going to survive this. Um, and it was so powerful, you could, you could feel it. And there was no way that you could not experience what happened at this place in the 1700s. And we came together as a community to experience that. And when I look at this, she was a superstar. And I just thought like, wow, she, how this place, and this, and she selected this location, particularly obviously because of its history, right? So she brought this project to bear so that we could face what had happened in that place. And that experience that she created, this is um, jazz musician Jason Moran. He composed a few um, site-specific pieces as well. Um, and he played a piano that then kind of steamed through the, the instrument. But how she helped us all kind of feel the pain of what had happened there and kind of heal and process through that. And so I want to leave you on this picture because this feels to me like very much a way that we looked at a place and looked at the nastiness that had happened there and came together as a community through this, this expression, which really art is kind of how my work is done, but um, to really heal together as a community and not ignore um, its past, but also help us to move through a little bit to kind of future that's much better. And I just love that all these people were just, I mean, it was like a paparazzi and it was just overlooking the city of New Orleans and overlooking just, you know, both pain and then out of that came this, you know, beautiful shared experience that I think helps all heal a little bit. So that's about it. Um, do you have any questions? Do you have any, how do you work it from here? Do you guys wanna, we've gone about 45 minutes, so. Yes. Uh huh. Yes. Yes, exactly. So I guess I'm thinking like how, and you're right, it's not so much about just like experience, it's a very different kind of art than um, historically or geographically mm -hmm. by the people who came in. How do you try to heal from the things that you were able to kind of mitigate against something that was so much more powerful? Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think that's the... I think that's the interesting thing. And I think that's what I had to question when I was in the process of sort of coalition building with Evolve Austin, right? Which was you had an environmental organization and an affordable housing organization and a mobility organization and all of these folks kind of coming together. Whereas there's also uh, a desire for affordable housing and there's also a desire for environmental uh, protection and things like that on the other side as well, you know? so. 
So ultimately, I think, um, I think power is always, um, you know, an issue. Um, and I think that um, there are instances when people create coalitions for an agenda versus to move forward. And I think um, that that's just, and I'm not going to say on either side what is what, right? I do believe that, and what I, I think I've learned in these weekly meetings, uh, this, this weekly uh, meeting called Building Bridges, is that if we don't take the time to truly understand what the motivations are, where the pain is, and what, um, what, what are the components that could truly benefit all, we're not going to be able to move forward, and we're going to see these divides um, even if it seems like they should be aligned. Does that make sense? Because our pain is coming from different experiences and different histories, you know? Does that make sense? So, I, I mean, I, I think it's what we're struggling with. I don't have an answer to it, or I would be the mayor, and we'd be like, you know, rocking a code next problem, you know, that had no problems, um, which isn't the case and won't be. But, um, so I don't know. I, you know, that picture of the bulldozer, that sign was in, in, on infield, you know, in West Austin, in the hills. And, it, you know, I mean, and then you can see, um, in East Austin, that same sign, so in the same type of an experience, is one protecting, um, you know, their yard size and their tree canopy, and which I love tree canopies, but, you know, is it protecting their sort of white privilege, you know, um, and is one protecting their community, you know? I wanted to, did we talk enough about the, I know you all have heard about Code Next. Um, did we address, I didn't want to get too technical because I don't have technical expertise in Code Next. Um, so I didn't want to kind of act like I did. That's not my, my background. It's really more from the perspective of, of the, the human side. Um, so I want to throw that back over to you. Did you think we offered enough of a varied perspective? Yeah. So it's transitioning into using that skill set for justice and community for yes. struggling communities. Yes. Um, more about your personal work. Mm -hmm. Well, I think so. Our work is getting much more deep. You know, um, we started in projects. I ran an arts organization for about ten years. Um, we started commissioning projects, placed and really started site specific, and then started getting a little bit more deep into place specific stuff. Um, and sort of, so my foray into it was really looking at things like the alleys, you know, things that I cared about that shaped my perspective. But now we're doing work um, as part of the city's economic development department. We're working on their um, Soli Austin program, and it's taking us into East 12th Street. Um, and that work is much more deep. Um, it's much more, there's so much happening. And that's where we started to really discover the depth of the pain that's in East Austin and, and the realities of why. It's very much legitimate. I mean, it's our history as a city. And so we've been unpacking that. Our first two districts were Red River Cultural District and Mayno Road, which were very, uh, they were much easier for me to just step into, right? Um, then we sort of started to, to work in East 12th Street. Then we did the downtown project, which was all they brought us on to talk to communities they hadn't heard from or asked ever, you know? And so before we did that work, we had to make sure, I can't be the token person that's walking out and saying, we want to hear from you if you're not going to follow up. You know, we can't make, we don't want to make the empty promises, you know? So, um, and now we're working in East 12th Street and the, which is how I came across Mr. Linder and Mr. Maynard and, this entire community of people that I'm learning from every day on the realities of what their experience of this place has meant and still means and why they're fighting for a different direction. And I think why, um, you know, I, I believe that Code Next and Imagine Austin is sincere and I, and I do believe that there is a real issue. There's facts, I mean, we don't have the housing stock, 
we're becoming more and I mean there's there's real things um, it's how we solve those that are the nuance um, and that I think we're battling over um, but that but working working there is what started to change my entire perspective on this city and how different my experience in the city was than theirs is and how relevant um, that perspective is I mean and pe particularly people that are planners and urban designer I mean when I sit across from Mr. Linder, I learn so much from him that I would never, ever experience as a white woman, ever. And it makes me understand that we just don't have enough personal time. We don't take the time to get to know one another anymore. We don't take the time to understand where people's problems are and why they are where they are. If they're angry, we're like, eh, angry, you know? Or he's just a blockade and it, there's just, I'm done listening. But the reality is that came from somewhere. And if we don't seek to understand where it came from, I don't know how as a city we move forward. Not that we should move forward though. So does that, I don't know if that, we haven't put projects on the ground yet in East 12. Um, the reality for me is I'm just not there yet. I don't know what the right projects are. Um, there are so many dynamics that you feel like if you make one step one way, it could be a catalyst for something that wouldn't be positive change or impact for the neighborhood. And somebody who loves Austin and who loves the city and doesn't want to leave anytime soon, I want to make sure that's not us making that misstep, you know? So, does that help? Exactly. So, you know, I have to use this problem that I was going to make you do a good idea of the thought process that was going to make. Yeah, it slowed me down. You know, um, it slowed me down. And I think what you start to see in this kind of work is that um, an art project might be a conduit, you know, to connect um, and to make progress and to build relationships and to better understand people. But you need multiple levers to ensure that your work isn't creating a negative impact, right? So the, the good thing with that is that we um, are working with the city's economic development department, right? So that there are some tools that could potentially be in place that could help mitigate that kind of change or help redirect some investment to where there is community benefit. Um, you know, it's a slippery slope, particularly in Texas, right? Like the property owner has, has the right do whatever they want with their property. I mean, there's some zoning things, but particularly in East 12th Street, you know, the community rallied together and downzoned an entire block along the corridor. Right? That's an example of a community saying, you know, you got to come through us first, right? You own that land, but we're a powerful force and we've got a voice and let's let's come together to make this transition collectively um, so that there isn't destruction. But I think that's that's the biggest fear is that in the end the work turns out to be destructive instead of constructive. Yeah. Well, the good news with Hope is that they found a permanent location, so that's great. Um, but that is, so I ran an arts organization for 10 years before I started Public City. And, um, you know, one of the things that is happening um, that was just released, which is something that I think Evolve Austin could get behind, which is also in the Imagine Austin plan, um, is a bond for creative spaces. So while there are, are few levers that can really, um, redirect the market. There are levers that a community can come together and say, we believe in this and so we'll invest in this, right? And so that's what's happening with this art space problem. Um, we also drafted the cultural tourism plan for the city. And, um, and I started my career at the Convention and Visitors Bureau. And, and the, w the reason why that's relevant is because the arts are currently funded through what's called the hotel occupancy tax, which is a visitor tax, right? And so you have to have this really great city that's full of cool things, that's really vibrant and awesome, um, that's, that has been using live music capital of the world as a slogan 
for 25 years and generating lots of money off of that without reinvesting it necessarily. But that's how the support, the eight or nine or $10 million a year that we get to support the arts, that's how it's generated is out of that tax, right? So when we drafted the cultural tourism plan, the foundation for that plan was to ensure that you have artists that can live here and create here affordably. Because if you don't have the artists and you don't have the infrastructure to support the artist, then you don't have the city that everybody is coming to visit, right? Because you've just completely cut out the entire reason people are here. So um, I think they're looking, you know, I don't, I mean, Pump Project, right? There, it's happening right now. Um, it's 50 different artists that are there. Um, they're, everybody's kind of scrambling, like, how are we going to find space for this? Um, so, you know, whether it was, I don't think it's too little too late. I don't want to be that girl, you know, but um, there is a crisis. And I do think that um, the Arts Commission and the Music Commission are coming together, you know, to try to propose something in the November bond, which is to the tune of like 30, 40 million dollars, something like that to support um, those creative spaces. So.